said, this is Joellen, and Heather is with me today, um, and we are going to facilitate our session and are very excited about it. I don't know, I think Heather will probably concur. We talked very briefly after our call last week or our session. We were both exhausted. My eyes didn't <laughs> stop going back and forth across that chat box. It, whether I was in front of my computer or not, my eyes were just darting all afternoon because I had gotten so used to reading the fast-paced words that kept appearing in front of me. So thank you for that deep level of engagement. And what I particularly appreciated about your interaction was the way you were supporting each other's learning. And I wanted to prompt uh, that and encourage you to continue that. Sometimes Heather and I can't attend to every question or comment, and you are able to do that to support each other, and, and we appreciate that. So this sense, week, go I ahead. Was, Absolutely. I was going to say, in a sense, we felt like we were facilitating a, a meeting rather than making a presentation of any kind. We were we were there to help you engage in the conversation with each other as much as um, engaging with us in the dialogue. So thank yeah. you. Yes, it was fun. It, it was it, it was a little frustrating, I have to admit. When I went back and was able to read the chat, that's when I really got a deep appreciation for how you were supporting each other, and it just popped off the chat. Uh, text and I, I appreciated it. So I want to review with you our program um, overview. This is session three. It's our middle session and we are focusing on a topic that many of you have been talking about for the last couple weeks. It seems that it's very hard to avoid how we evaluate the effectiveness of coaching and coaches and so today is our day to give back some thought. And it fits kind of in the middle, even though it's something we think about before, middle, and end. I want to also review with you our outcomes. These are things you have seen at each session. And you'll see that, again, the middle outcome, which is the outcome focused on um, determining the effectiveness and looking at different ways of measuring the effectiveness of the coaching program as well as individual coaches. and so as you take a look at that series of outcomes, know that we're focusing on that particular one. And Heather and I are smiling at you. Um, I am in Kentucky. Um, I am in the capital of Franklin at the Kentucky Department of Education today where it is very, very foggy and very, very cold. And we are expecting some of that Chicago snow to slip down this way, and I'm hoping to get out of Kentucky, out of this part of Kentucky, and a little further west, where I'm hoping that snow will avoid me, and I don't get caught up into that. So, as we think about today's outcomes, I hope that you'll leave the session having some tools for evaluating your coaching program and coaches. I know some of you would ask the question, well, why do I need to know how to evaluate coaches? And I think you'll see what the connection is. Some of that evaluation might even be self-analysis and self-reflection. We'll talk about a theory of change, which for us is a fundamental tool that contributes to evaluation. And we'll talk about some data sources that we have available to support you already or that would be relatively easy to tap into. So those are our outcomes for today. Heather? Thank you. So we want to start with making a distinction between evaluation of coaching versus evaluation of coaches. And so we have worked in lots of school districts and um, because coaches are part of the staff of schools or school districts, they are generally evaluated like other teachers are. But what we have often found is that coaching programs have not been evaluated and people have not given the forethought to how they might evaluate the effectiveness of their programs 
ahead of time, and that's really when you need to start thinking about evaluating on the coaching program. But um, it, it can't be something that's done after the fact or, or as an afterthought. It, it really needs to be considered up front. Um, it, evaluating the coaching um, program allows us to have some information that will direct us for the future. What can, what's working and what's not working and what can we do differently, both with the program and how can we increase the effectiveness of our coaches and their practices. So it's an important distinction that we make and it's important that we do both of these things as we think about the effectiveness of our um, coaching um, efforts in our schools. So we want to start with asking you um, a question, some questions about your own practices with your coaching programs or teacher leadership programs in your schools or districts. Um, the first question is posted here for the, the first poll. Are you currently conducting or have you current, conducted either a formal or an informal evaluation of your coaching and or teacher leadership program? So you see some options here. Tom has posted. Um, some options for you to weigh in on this, and I see that some of you are doing this. Thank you. So, it's like we, um, this is confirming what I said um, earlier that a lot of times there is not much regard paid to how we evaluate the coaching program and sometimes we're not uh, up to speed with how we evaluate coaches either but we see that some of you have some experience with that and we appreciate seeing um, that you have engaged in those kinds of things. So um, do we think we have everybody there? So let's let's go on to another uh, question here. In the current or newly emerging educator evaluation systems in your district, so let me just pause for a minute and explain that a little bit. We we're in in Colorado here. Um, we are operating um, in anticipation of a law that has been implemented and to the effects of a law that has been um, legislated within the last couple of years that ties um, student achievement to teacher effectiveness and consequently there's some implications for coaches. Um, so as you think about the evaluation systems that are in your district that may be new or are current, are there distinct performance criteria for coaches or others in roles similar, similar to coaches um, or, or are coaches operating under the umbrella of teachers in general or some other um, category. Um, when you consider how they're being evaluated, what, what are there distinct criteria that have been developed to define the, um, the expectations for coaches or teacher leaders in those roles? So let's go to the second poll and see where you, where you uh, stand with that. So we don't see many schools or districts that have actually defined the expectations for, for coaches and created um, the criteria for their performance evaluation. Only, only one of you out of 38 participants so far are saying that there are clear performance, set, performance expectations for coaches. We have worked, Joellen and I and uh, Cindy and Chris, all four of us have worked in school districts where there um, has been thoughtful attention paid to what are the expectations for coaches and criteria defined very specifically. And we think that's an important thing for us to consider as we um, develop our coaching program and as we plan on how we might evaluate the effectiveness of the coaching program. So um, it, it, we're a ways from having that being a standard in our schools and districts who are implementing coaching programs, but it's something to look toward which to aspire because um, the clearer we are about 
the, um, the roles of the coaches and uh, as well the, the roles of or the impact or the intended um, implementation or, or design of the coaching program, the more likely the effectiveness will be measured and we will know what we can do to improve either the coach or the coaching program. So it's an important thing for us to be considering as we move forward. So um, let, let's invite you to, to um, post some comments. And um, let's see, we have some other slide here. What are, what are the implications? As you consider the fact that you may not have, and most of you don't, have specific criteria for the coach's role. What, how, what implications does that have for your coaching program? Let's see what you might have to say about that. And we'll try to respond and, to some of your comments. Yeah, and Heather, I'm going to suggest, because I know a lot of people are having a hard time hearing you, I don't know if it's your phone line or just a bad connection. So while people are taking a minute or two to chat some responses, then I uh, wonder if you could call back in and let's see if we can get a clearer line uh, for you and um, we'll be able to go ahead. So I wanted to just call back to the line. I'll do that right now. Thank you. Thanks. So we can give you all a chance to respond to implications and um, Hopefully, we'll get Heather back on a little clearer audio. Yeah, thanks, Kathy. It's pretty hard to evaluate when you don't have the definition um, or even a role um, description in place. So what are we asking coaches to be able to do and make sure that we have the right kind of criteria in place? So, yeah, getting some clear expectations, um, both for coaches as well as for a coaching uh, program. Heather, are you back? I'm, I'm back on now. And there's also a great line. I, I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but it's actually worse. Oh, no. Okay. Oh, Let me try. That was good. No, that was good right there. So well, I don't know. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Chris, well, <laughs> Chris thinks the storm got you. But I hear you, I think, pretty clearly now. So I'll be quiet okay. for a minute and let you talk. Okay. Thank you. Um, so it, um, I'm just looking at some of the responses that you're posting. Um, Yes. Um, I like the, the point that the, evalu the innovation configuration maps that accompany the standards for professional learning really do help to define what the coach's um, impact can be and what the coach's role is um, when it comes to supporting teachers. Great. Well, I, I want to just say to you all that even though many of you indicated that you didn't have a program in place or an evaluation in place of your coaching, it's never, never too late to get started. So um, we're hearing some background noise there. Um, okay, good deal. So we can always start and we can start with ourselves as individuals. So maybe my, my district or school doesn't have a formal program in place to evaluate me as a coach or to evaluate coaching. However, I can take it upon myself to do some informal and formative evaluation just by engaging with my colleagues in a simple question at the end of an interaction, what was helpful to you today? What was not helpful to you today? What um, would you like me to do differently next time? So we don't have a weight as coaches. So I'm not sure um, why I'm hearing a lot of noise, but I'm 
I'm hearing a lot of noise on the line. Um, so I think we can continue to ask ourselves, how do we get information personally, even if the system isn't providing us access to that information? So remember, we don't have to be the ones to wait for somebody else to do the work. As a professional, we all have responsibility for continuous improvement. And I encourage us to think about how we can take uh, responsibility to be engaged in evaluating, um, even on a formative basis, a formative assessment of our own work. So thank you very much. Um, Heather, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Can everybody hear me now? Can you can you hear me now? I hear you, Heather. Okay. I'm seeing a lot of rustling and stuff, and I don't know where that's coming from, but I hear your voice. Okay. So you know what? Hold on. This is this is Tom. Hold on. I'm gonna do one thing real quick. Um, I'm going to just mass mute everyone's phone real quick, and then Heather, when you start, if you would hit pound six, which will reactivate you. I just want to okay. mute everybody because I hear that background noise too. The leader has muted your line. To unmute your line, press pound six. Okay. Now can is everybody hearing me? I'm going to. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the goals of the coaching program. So um, I, I want to call your attention to the, the statement that's on the screen. Increased student learning through increased teacher efficacy and teaching effectiveness is what we are looking for in a coaching program. And so there's a, a distinction that we want to make here as well. When we talk about teaching effectiveness, we're not talking about evaluating coaches on the basis of um, who they are as people. We're talking about evaluating their practices. So as we're looking at evaluating our, our coaching programs, we're trying to determine whether or not the practices that teachers, coaches are using are making a difference in the practices that teachers are using, which leads to increased student learning. So it's an important distinction because sometimes this is a, a, a sensitive area. When we're talking about teacher effectiveness and teacher efficacy, um, the coach can make a difference. And in a minute, Joellen's going to talk a little bit more about the theory of change and some of the things that we do in order to move forward with our coaching program. But the goals of the program are important and they need to be measurable goals that create the framework for how we evaluate the program. If you look on page 133 of your book, if you have it handy, um, there are a couple of questions. There are three questions at the top of page 133 that um, define what the goals um, what questions the goals might answer. What is the program intended to accomplish? What are its intended results? And whom will the coaching program affect? So if we write our goals for the program and we are deliberate and thoughtful in the beginning about aligning the learning goals that we have for students with the goals for teachers and goals for coaches, and the coaching program, we can ensure that we have a way to measure whether or not our program is as effective as we want it to be. So it's important that those goals be written in a SMART format. I'm sure you're familiar with SMART goals, specific, measurable, attainable, results-based, and time-bound. Um, and there are uh, examples of um, goals for coaching programs, once again, on page 133 and 134 that you can uh, look at and, and um, determine how these goals for students are aligned with the goals for teachers, and then ultimately we align those with the goals for coaches as well. Um, so that's kind of what we're talking about with regard to uh, the goals for, for coaching. Joellen, you want to talk about the theory of change?
hear me now? Hello. Are you hearing me now? Now I can hear you. Okay, great. I, I wasn't sure whether, I know that when Tom muted everybody's lines, that meant mine as well, and so I forgot to unmute. Um, so when we talk about this whole notion of trying to figure out the degree to which coaching is influencing teacher practice and student achievement, we want to think about it in relationship to being able to map out in our own minds how we expect that change to happen. And we use a tool that's called a theory of change. And a theory of change explains how we think change will happen. And, it's, um, and as a part of that, we might identify the actions that we need to take. It also sequences the stages of change, so it gives us a sense of what the process or sequence is that we will use. And then the other thing that it does is identifies assumptions, whether it's one or more assumptions upon which the theory is based. So a theory of change becomes a very useful tool for explaining to people how we think this change is going to happen, providing a guide for helping us act on our theory of change, and it becomes a very powerful tool to use in the evaluation process. So I have one that I use of coaching, and here it is. It's a pretty general one. Um, it's certainly not finite, and it could be more finite if you wanted it to be. But the theory is that if a coach is using effective coaching practices, that those practices will, in fact, influence teacher understanding of what effective teaching and learning are. And if the teacher understands his or her responsibility and has the knowledge and skills, then those will all affect what a teacher does in practice. And what a teacher does in practice influences what a student understands about his role and what he or she needs to know and be able to do. And that understanding then influences a student's learning, or we could call it achievement, or we could call it results, whatever the right word is that we would want to use. And then, in reality, once we know where students are, that then sort of drives coaches back to thinking about what they might need to be doing in supporting teachers to continue this process of improvement. So there's a couple what are typically called black boxes in the evaluation process as you look at this diagram. And the two black boxes, the ones that we often are very, have a very difficult time getting after in a very intentional way, or really even acting on in an intentional way, are the ones that are teacher understanding and student understanding. So let me play this out for you with just a, a classic little scenario of what a coach might be doing. So a coach might be working with a teacher around how to meet the needs of uh, students who learn differently in their classrooms. And so the coach perhaps has done a demonstration lesson of how to do some differentiation in instruction and differentiation of assignments or learning tasks for students and then expect the teacher to be able to uh, model and replicate those practices. But a teacher might not be able to really understand what the coach is doing and how the coach made the decisions that the coach made in the demonstration lesson, or even have the right knowledge or skill level to be able to model or enact what the coach did in a demonstration lesson. And so the coach has a responsibility to help the teacher unpack what the coach used in terms of knowledge and skills, the decision-making process, perhaps the 
the um, understanding of students and student learning strategies and styles to be able to make the decisions he or she did. So we very often will expect that from a model lesson or a demonstration lesson, we could almost immediately see the teacher practice the same skills, but unless we take the time to unpack whether or not the teacher understands it and knows how to make the same kinds of decisions about instruction and learning the coach made, then we can't hold that expectation. So the coach asks uh, questions. The coach may do a think aloud in the lesson planning process. The coach may co-plan with the teacher. All of these are strategies to get after teacher understanding in order for us to expect the kind of practice that we might see. And then the other black box occurs in the student understanding, and that's the one that's really focused on assessing students' thinking and assessing students' understanding. And we know more about that, and we use that, that, those strategies of formative assessment, assessment in classrooms far more comfortably than we would in using the same kind of formative assessment in uh, assessing teachers' understanding. So I wanted to put this up in front of you because this might be a model for how your coaching works. When coaches are interacting with teachers, are they assessing teacher understanding? Are they using their assessing of teacher understanding to hold teachers, uh, to support teachers in shifting their practices? And are they continuing their support far enough into the process of helping teachers assess student understanding to know whether or not we're going to be able to get to student learning. So this is just one theory of change. We could have another theory of change, but this is one I like to use. It's based on an unpacking of the research on uh, both professional learning as well as um, student learning, and the research is grounded in a multi-year in-depth literature review that was conducted in New Zealand. So uh, I just wanted to bring this example to you. So again, if we don't have a theory of change that helps us say how we expect coaching to improve teaching and student learning, it's pretty hard to evaluate the impact of coaching on teaching and student learning. And it's pretty hard for us sometimes even to explain to people how we expect it to happen. One of the things that's really cool about this theory of change is that once we map out the steps, we can almost immediately see where the leverage points are for data. And we're going to get into it, uh, into that in just a minute. So. Um, let me share with you this, uh, this slide about theory of change. I see a couple of you asking me to name the study. The authors were Timperley, Helen Timperley, and um, the other co-author was Alton Lee, which is a hyphenated last name. And for the life of me, I can't remember the uh, first name of that person. But I will find that study and post, uh, post its full details for you um, when I get a chance, um, probably within the next day or two. So here are some reasons why theories of change, and I think it would be helpful for you all to think about from your own perspective, why are theories of change helpful? And for me, these are some of the important reasons that it maps the change. It tells us what we're going to do. It delineates what's expected so that people who are engaged in the change know how it's going to work. It gives us opportunities for checking progress. So if we go back, if we know teachers aren't understanding, then we can't expect them to practice. So we have to go back and spend more time in the understanding step. So it gives us sort of a, an opportunity to assess progress and to use interventions when needed. And theories of change help us inform future changes. So 
every time we're faced with something new, we don't have to start from scratch again. We can look at that theory of change we used and ask ourselves, what of this theory of change um, do we have the opportunity to apply in a new situation? So I'm going to pause there and just ask you to take a minute and share your thoughts about how you think a theory of change would help you before we move on to looking at data. How will a theory of change help you? Thanks, Kate. Katie, that's great. The uh, phone in the conference room where I'm hiding out is ringing. I'm going to put myself on mute and go deal with that. <laughs> Good comment about um, being able to explain the positions. Kathy, thank you. That black box part is tricky. It, we have to we have to delve in. Thank you for your comment there. I talk about putting the spotlight on inside that black box so we can see what's going on. And I think we can do that by engaging in the kinds of conversations we engage with, uh, engage in with teachers and with students about their own learning. I appreciate Lisa's comment about think alouds. Sometimes that's what coaches have to do in order to be able to help teachers to understand um, what's behind the uh, practices that they might be modeling. Indeed, yes. You know, so often we assume that modeling something for someone is the best way to help them do it. And we have to remember modeling is only one small piece of understanding all of the cognitive work that goes on behind the scenes of the model. There are different types of coaching that we're seeing more and more of in our work, um, but in ear coaching, um, whisper coaching, the kinds of coaching that helps teachers to understand the rationale and the potential impact of an action they might take um, in the moment where the coach is really being useful to the teacher and helping them to see uh, exactly what, what might happen next. You know, Heather, you were just saying that, and I'm reminded about the kinds of instructional shifts we're asking teachers to make in classrooms, by, particularly in math, uh, for example, by having students explain their thinking and to um, show how they're coming to a particular solution and explain their processing of uh, a mathematical problem or even their text interaction. And that process of explaining how you got there or what you're thinking is exactly what we're asking coaches to do with teachers about their own teaching actions. Exactly. What is being asked of teachers in the Common Core Standards is um, it can be modeled by uh, coaches with teachers. Good point. All right, Heather, I'm going to let you take it from here. Okay, I'm going to move us forward a little bit. Um, so as we think about collecting data in the evaluation process, as we start thinking about how we collect information that will inform us, about what's working with our programs and what changes we might need to be making in our programs because things are not working as effectively as they might. We have to consider the fact that there are different 
audiences or different groups of stakeholders who have a different um, needs related to what they want to know about the effectiveness of the coaching program. I think it was Lisa who earlier posted a comment about how um, expensive it can be for school districts, boards of education, um, and to invest in coaching initiatives. And they have questions that might be different than the questions that the coaches might be asking um, of themselves about the effectiveness of their work. So um, we want to uh, point you to, um, again, a, a page in the book on page 135. Um, you can see what some of the common questions might be of different audiences, different stakeholder groups, um, related to the effectiveness of the coaching program. So um, school boards, here, let's go to this slide. School boards might be asking that general question, is the coaching worth the investment? We have put lots of money into this coaching role. We know that we're, there are always programs and initiatives that are competing for the dollars that we have available for our school improvement efforts. And um, how do we know that coaching is making the difference and is it, is it worth what we are putting into it? So that might be the, the question that a school board member might have. Central office people might have d different questions. Um, so they have questions along the way. The, post, the one that's posted here is, in what areas do coaches need more professional learning? So as they think about the effectiveness of coaches themselves in those roles, what are the things that they could be doing to support coaches in order to help them to be more effective? So they can be asking those questions along with lots of other ones. Um, the coach herself or himself probably is asking the question, how do I know that I'm making a difference in my work? Um, I'm carrying out the processes that I've been trained to do. I, I assess what teachers' needs are and I'm doing what I think I, my job description says I should be doing, but is it really having the impact? And how will I know whether or not my work is having an impact on teachers' practices in general? And then teachers have questions. Teachers, we all know that there are teachers who, um, as we talked about last week, um, may be resistive to the notion of coaching. Teachers who are feeling that it's better worth um, our dollars to be investing in smaller class sizes, hire more teachers, for example, instead of coaches. Um, how do teachers assess whether or not their practices um, are changing as a result of the work they're doing as coaches? Do they, are they more efficacious? Do they think that they can make a difference, that they are making better decisions in their classrooms because of the work that they might be doing with coaches? So um, these are some of the things that we want people to consider um, when you're planning your evaluation of your program. What are the questions that various audiences might be posing that will need to be addressed? And this helps us to determine what kind of data we're going to be collecting in order to determine whether or not we're achieving the results that our program is set out to do. Um, so we have a, is this a poll here, Jill Mellon? No, um, I think, first, but, yeah. yeah, I think we were going to try to gather from you what some of the data uh, sources and data types are that you have uh, available to you now, and then we wanted to offer some suggestions to you. I think what's particularly um, interesting about trying to evaluate coaching and coaches is that we do have, as Heather was just sharing with you, so many different audiences who have so many different kinds of questions. And the different kinds of questions they're asking don't necessarily get answered using the same kind of data. So if we were to look at that list of questions, I'm just going to turn back to that slide, we might think about um, if we were trying to answer all of these, an incredible data burden that might be placed on coaches and teachers and principals and others to get everything we needed to be able to answer all these questions. So we want to look at um, 
some ways that we can get after some of the data we need to answer the questions and to keep that in a somewhat um, feasible format so that it is burdening anyone significantly yet at the same time giving us the kind of information that we need. So I'm going to just ask you if you would to just share some thoughts about what sources and types of data are currently available to you. They may not be being used to evaluate the coaching program or to provide feedback or information to coaches, but what might be there that you could tap into? And so we'll get some of your thoughts and then Heather and I will share some of the data sources that we, um, some others that we think you might be able to to use. So perception surveys, and Carla, just share a little bit with us about perceptions, what kind of perceptions. Some of you were saying surveys of teachers. What would be the things that we would ask teachers? So the innovation configurations, logs, but I, I'm particularly interested in those survey things. What kinds of things might we ask on those surveys? They are great data tools, but we got to know the content. Ah, Car about the school culture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Carla has mentioned the innovation configuration maps. Um, once again, that if other people are curious about that. It, the innovation configuration maps are available um, through Learning Forward in a book that accompanies the standards for professional learning. And it defines what the um, levels of implementation are for different groups or different um, uh, roles in the operation of the or the uh, implementation of professional learning in schools. Yeah. So topics, uh, logs, reading agenda. Um, those are all great sources. Um, oh, you can catch your standards and practice books. So you've got the IC maps for coaches. And while they're great, they may not be completely everything you need. I think you can uh, use them, and you'll definitely want to refer to them. So reflection sheets, those are great sources. These are things and that you can mine. Sometimes a simple exit slip at the end of a meeting with, uh, that a coach might have facilitated with a team of teachers can be useful data that helps um, the coach to reflect on what has gone well during that meeting and what might be needed by the participants the next time. In a more wow. formal sense, we've used um, uh, focus groups to determine the effectiveness of the coaching program. And um, that can be done very formally with the, all the integrity that a focus group sometimes requires, or it can be done informally. Um, but getting that perception of different groups, teachers or principals or central office people about the implementation of the program and its effect is a useful tool. So I, um, I think that what you're identifying here, everyone, are some great uh, data sources that may already exist uh, for you that you could tap into. Certainly if coaches are providing some logs, if there are um, feedback surveys, there are some great examples of tools in the book that you are more than welcome to take and adapt so that they fit the context of your program and would be comfortable and informative for your coaches and teachers and principals to use. Um, we, for many years, my involvement in the work uh, with coaches in Fairfax County, we did evaluations basically doing a couple things. One, we kept logs of what coaches were doing so that we could look at that and see whether there were patterns in those actions. We did school culture surveys 
every year before uh, pre and post, so in the early school year and at the end of the school year, because we think one of the things that was a, a goal of the coaching or is a goal of the coaching program in Fairfax County is um, improving the culture so that it's more collaborative and we saw coaches as being instrumental in that. And then we also looked at student achievement on formative and summative assessments. And those were the big data points that we used um, to evaluate that coaching program. The only one uh, tool that had to be added that wasn't already a natural part of the work was the culture survey, but now that culture survey is being used in every school in the county, whether they have a co coach or not. So um, I think as you look at this, you want to ask yourself, what's going to give us the mediating factors that help us understand whether teachers are shifting behavior and whether or not coaches are having the influence they want us, they want to have. So um, I personally am a fan of those uh, surveys that give, and I think Lorraine is just noting that the brief little surveys, whether they're done orally or done in writing, that give feedback, immediate feedback to a coach about the effectiveness of a particular coach interaction. Coach can model transparency and continuous improvement by asking those few questions at the end of every interaction. Um, that kind of modeling becomes very helpful, I think. So I contend, friends, that you have a lot of data available to you. And we need to start using these data to make sense of whether or not coaching and coaches are effective. Because here's something I know. Down the road, when the time comes where there are questions about budget or programming or whatever, and you are missing the data about the effectiveness of coaching, it will be among the first things on the list. So those of you just starting, I encourage you strongly be aggressive about the evaluation. And for those of you that are deep in, I hope you don't are, are not ever in a position to hear what I heard yesterday from a chief academic officer who said, I wonder whether or not our coaches are really effective. They've been in place four years. We have 24 of them. The average cost is $60,000 a year. I wonder if it's really worth the investment. And I found that somewhat fiscally irresponsible to be asking that question four years later. All right, Heather. Oh, I guess I guess the next piece. I guess the next piece. So um, let me just ask you because our time is is getting close here. I, I'd like to have you think about um, how you can learn from evaluations that you're conducting, whether they are big, formal, district-wide, program-wide evaluations, whether they are focused specifically on individual performance. These are some of the ways I think the evaluation work that you do, formal or informal, summative or formative, becomes helpful to you. So they help you deconstruct, interpret, and act on information. They help us improve our um, improvement decisions, our actions. What do we do to get better? Um, one of the things we've learned in coaching programs is that we need to set tighter parameters. So we started with loose parameters and discovered, for example, that without the parameter of how much time a coach needed to be in direct interaction with one or more teachers, then we weren't seeing the kind of expectation that we had. So the data helped us. Evaluations are necessary for existence. And I um, think that the more 
frequent and formative they can be, the more people will see them as a helpful tool rather than uh, something to be afraid of. So what are your thoughts about how evaluation, how you might conduct an evaluation and how evaluation can be useful to you? So I think maybe, Kevin, we can pause for a minute or two and see what people are thinking. How sure. Let me just repeat those two questions. How might you go about evaluating coaching or coaches? And how will evaluation help you? So just a couple of thoughts on one or both of those questions. It's so true that you have to be clear about what your goals are. Yeah, Dana, I, I equate accountability with evaluation, I, um, and I think it takes all those pieces um, to be working together. Um, Kathy, you've noted that if coaches are not engaged in e evaluation and continuous development, it's pretty hard for them to be talking about it to others. And the use of multiple data sources is very important, and that has to be planned. Um, it, it, it's better planned if you can think about that up front and have a, a design for what kind of information you're going to be collecting. That's helpful. Right. Katie, I, I, I find your comment of daunting something that I resonate with. It is not an easy task. Um, and I think that being thoughtful about how to do it within the resources that are available, there are some excellent resources in the book to support you. Chris, Heather, and uh, Cindy were engaged in doing an evaluation of um, the school system, the coaching program in the school system in which I live. And there are some great resources that they used. And so I think you'll find some. Um, some resources there to help you. Some of those resources are available in the tools. Um, yeah. Those tools that are available online, you'll find samples of uh, focus group questions and um, survey information. Okay. Marguerite, thanks for relaying Sheila's comments. Those are lovely comments uh, about evaluation um, really being that stepping stone for continuous uh, improvement and helping us think about how we enhance our own skills, how we build capacity, um, and effective programmatic decisions, just in case you're not seeing that comment. These are so many good comments here. I encourage you to go back and read through these. Thank you all. And so as we begin to um, wind down a little bit here, we have uh, just a few more minutes. We'd like for you to pause and reflect a little bit about um, these questions. Who needs to know what you learned today? You should think about the learning that you have experienced from tough chatting with each other, from hearing Joellen and me talk about the evaluation of coaching programs. How can you personally benefit from this information, even if no one else knows what you now know about evaluating coaching and coaches. What are your thoughts about that? Take a minute to chat a little bit about that. I think Dana and Carla are identifying, um, and even Kathy is making it clear that we've got to be clear about what the expectations are and that we have to work in unison in a team. This is, we can't just have um, 
you know, sort of an isolated little approach. We need at least a unified approach to some aspects of evaluation at a district level. Certainly individual coaches can do something more informal, but I think if we really are going to assess the effectiveness of a program, we need a plan to do that. We need a focus and um, a clear methodology. I like your comment, Kevin. I think that when we involve teachers in evaluating the program, we get more buy-in from them. They, if they have a perception that they have a chance to influence whether or not the coach's work is impacting their practices, they are more invested in the program. Great comment, right. Marguerite. Yeah. It's about learning and decision making. It's not about judgment. And you know, I think one of the reasons why we have, unfortunately, in our evaluation practices in the past, been uh, approaching evaluation as such a judgmental process. And, and technically, the judgment is the final step of the evaluation work, but really where the leverage is in any kind of evaluation work is in the data collection, analysis, interpretation. That's where the leverage is. That's why we've worked for years to help teachers know how to work with student data and why we have learned to use data to improve uh, what we're doing in classrooms for kids and the kind of instructional practices. And we're using the same kind of approach now to think about how we help strengthen the support we're providing teachers, just as we're asking teachers to do the same for students. And again, we're focusing more on teachers' practices, not necessarily the teachers themselves. It's what are they doing in their classrooms and what data can we um, collect that is evidence of um, our, our work's uh, effectiveness. So I'm going to uh, slide into this next slide. I, I was pretty cute when I designed this slide, and I think somehow or another my cross off of challenges got eliminated, um, probably with one of those editing things we did along the way. I meant to cross off challenges and have you see that I had done that and have opportunities left. So I wanted to, I think, reiterate what many of you are saying, that we should look at this work not as a way to un cover the challenges we have, but to look at the opportunities uh, we have to refine and really elevate our practice so that it does some of the things many of you said, like, I, you know, how do we know whether we're helping people with the needs that they have? How do we know whether or not we're leveraging our skills and expertise to promote change? Are we meeting teachers' needs? so they can meet students' needs. And we could look at that all as challenges, but I would love for us to begin to unpack the data we're collecting and look for opportunities in our practice rather than challenges in our practices. So I think evaluation is a way to help us do that. And if we are beginning to engage with our colleagues in thinking about having opportunity-oriented conversations and opportunity-oriented data analysis rather than challenge-oriented, I think that we can promote um, a greater openness and willingness to examine data and participate in the data collection, analysis, and interpretation part of an evaluation process. So Heather, I'm going to just be quiet and let you wrap up. Okay. So um, as with all of the other chapters in the book, 
you will notice that we have listed some recommendations. This is on page 145 of chapter 11. Um, recommendations for central office administrators, for building administrators, and for coaches of things that you might do as you um, consider ways to improve this aspect of your coaching program. That is to have a clearer, uh, clear goals and um, measurements for determining whether or not your coaching program and the coaches are as effective as that you intended them to be uh, when you designed the program. So we just want to um, encourage you to take a look at that and think about what implications that might have for you, whatever your role might be in um, the coaching program or teacher leadership program that you're working with. So um, in anticipation of uh, the next session, we want you to look back a little bit and share in the community your, uh, throughout the week your experiences with evaluating coaching and coaches and uh, offer any tools that you have used in your processes that might be of benefit to other people. And um, we will try to make sure that we uh, offer any additional things that we find as well. And we want to use this as an opportunity for people to share resources. And then we also want you to look forward and read chapters 7 and 8. So we're moving backwards in the book, but we want you to read chapters 7 and 8 for next week. Um, the, the topic is uh, professional support for uh, professional learning for um, coaches, the ongoing professional support that they are getting. And um, so we want you to take a little bit of time to look at those chapters before next week and um, again, think about uh, implications that this might have for you and your coaching program. Um, how do these needs shift um, as coaches become more experienced? Um, what's an area in which you wish you'd had more professional learning before you became a coach, for example? Um, what are areas that you currently want more professional uh, learning in? So all of this is focused on a way to get us um, thinking more about how do we provide the support as we move forward with coaching programs for the coaches who are carrying out the work. So I think that brings us to the end of our session. I want to thank you all again for your involvement and engagement today. We had lots of good discussion going on during the session. I apologize for the sound, sound difficulties we had earlier on, but I, I look forward to chatting with you um, on, in the community forum throughout the week. And thank you all for being here. And this is Tom, and, and thank you, uh, Heather, and thank you, Joellen, for another great week. And I just, um, Xandria, thank you for posting what you posted about kind of sitting back and listening and there being a lot to think about. And I would really just echo um, what Carla wrote and encourage you to, you know, share what's going on with you in the community. And if you, you can probably tell over these uh, first two and a half weeks of our session that uh, we've got a group here that is, is very, very willing to share uh, ideas and strategies and resources and actual documents and all that stuff to, uh, uh, to, to help you and to uh, help the group uh, as a whole. So we, we are a few minutes late. I'm going to just let everybody go. Um, be on the lookout later on this afternoon for a recording of, of this session. And then I will, uh, a couple people have requested, I will um, paste the chat uh, transcript into a doc and uh, shoot that out to everybody as well. Have a great rest of the week, uh, and, and we'll continue our discussion in the forum this week. Uh, and have a good uh, weekend. And we will talk to everybody next Tuesday. So thank you again so much for being here. And we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks for being with us.